Hello. Good morning. <laughs> um, welcome. Uh, I am Sean Evans. I'm Jacqueline Navy. I'm Mackenzie Mack. I'm Michael Manenberg. Um, and we are the lead co-organizers of Art and Feminism, um, but really, like, we think of art and feminism as like all of you and all of the people around the world who are editing. Um, you may have seen on screen a moment ago, there were Twitter shots from around the world because we've had edit-a-thons going on over the past week. Um, so what art and feminism is, is a worldwide collective of students, librarians, professors, artists, art workers, and art lovers who want to create I don't want to be closer to the mic. <laughs> who, who create meaningful changes um, to the body of knowledge available about feminism and the arts on Wikipedia. Um, and we're super excited to share this day with you. Um, when we started this project four years ago, we committed ourselves to this work, um, not for ourselves, but for the betterment of the representation of all women, um, black women, trans women, Bengali women, queer women, Puerto Rican women, cis women, white women, women who struggle economically, women who seek to use their resources to do good in the world, so women like all of you. Um, and that said, now we're going to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of the day before introducing our amazing panelists that I'm sure you're all really excited to hear. So we're, we're starting a little bit later. Um, so slide everything I'm gonna tell you maybe 15 minutes later. Uh, after we have this panel, we're going to break out into three different tracks of things you can do. There's going to be trainings every 90 minutes, starting with the first training at 11. So let's just call that 11.15 or so. Um, and, or excuse me, uh, 11.30. So let's call that 11.45. Um, and at uh, 1 o'clock, starting at 1 o'clock, there's also going to be breakout sessions. The first one at 1 o'clock is uh, about radical archives with interference archive. The second one is going to be um, about the work of Afro Crowd and Black Lunch Table. The third one at 3 p.m. is going to be about intersectional feminism and librarianship. And the fourth one is going to be about notability uh, and the intersections of uh, notability and other forms of structural racism and sexisms. Um, at 5 p.m. we're gonna gather for uh, a reception with cake. Throughout all of this, there's going to be places to edit throughout the building. There's food on the second floor. Um, there's coffee on the second floor in the cafe. Please eat and drink ca caffeine. Drink, <laughs> eat, drink your coffee, get your caffeine if you need that. Um, the trainings are on the second floor in the Time Warner Theater. There's going to be breakout sessions are going to be in classroom B. Um, and there's editing in the mezzanine the mezzanine is actually the lower floor. Uh, it's confusing, I think, uh, at times, uh, but I've kind of gotten adjusted to it after a third year here. Um, the mezzanine is what you were just in when you were drinking coffee. Um, and uh, there's uh, Power Arts and Afro Crowd are hosting thematic tables there. Um, there's quiet editing on the sixth floor in the library and the archives. If you didn't bring a computer with you, there are their computers out on the tables in the mezzanine and their individual laptops in the archives on the sixth floor. I think I've covered that. Oh, one other thing. If you're here for just a little bit, obviously come to this panel. If you've got a little bit longer, go to one of the trainings and uh, learn about Wikipedia. When you get out of those trainings, if you only have a little bit more time after that, just make a simple, add a citation to um, an article. If you have a little bit more train time than that, you can think about creating an article. If you are thinking about creating an article and you haven't done so before, please reach out to one of the more experienced Wikipedians in the room. Anyone who's got um, a, a bandana on can help you direct help direct you to them. So, great. Hi everyone. You should give yourself some snaps for being here today. Showing up. Thank you. Um, before we start, I'm gonna, we're going to set an expectation for the day, and that expectation is safe, brave space. So what does that mean? It means that the goal of this edit-a-thon is to create a space for collective learning. Um, this requires intentional behavior, wherein participants are conscious and accountable, um, not just of their intent, but the impact of their actions and what they say. Um, we respect our experiences and the experiences of other people, but we recognize that we can't do this work without one another. 
if you're being harassed, you notice that someone else is being harassed or have any concerns of any, of any kind, contact um, a team member. You can also let me know if you see me walking around or text me, 773-844-4607. <laughs> you're on the train later, text me. I will show up for you. Um, special thanks goes out to the Modern Women's, Women's Fund, Wikimedia Foundation, uh, Wikimedia DC, Wikimedia New York City, NYC, Afro Crowd um, for leading our breakout sessions with Black Lunch Table, all of our volunteers who have shown up for us today, and our volunteer coordinator, Sarah Klugage, we thank you as well. Um, and in addition to that, MoMA Department of Education, and of course you for coming and learning how to edit or just coming to make contributions, we appreciate it. Yeah, snaps, snaps. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we're so pleased to have Kimberly Drew and Joanne McNeil and Zara Rahman here with us today, and we're really looking forward to the conversation that will emerge. Um, but first, I have the honor of introducing them all to you. Uh, so Kimberly Drew, aka Museum Mammy, received her BA from Smith College in Art History uh, and African American Studies with a concentration in Museum Studies. An avid lover of black culture and art, Drew first experienced the art world as an intern uh, in the director's office at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Her time at the Studio Museum inspired her to start the Tumblr, uh, the Tumblr blog, Black Contemporary Art, sparking her interest in social media. Okay, great. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Uh, Joanne McNeil is a writer interested in the ways that technology is shaping art, politics, and society. She was a 2015 fellow of the Carl and Marilyn Toma Arts Art Foundation, receiving an inaugural Arts Writing Fellowship Award for an emerging digital arts writer. She is currently writing a book on what it means to be an internet user. Sarah Rahman is a researcher, writer, lingu and linguist who's interested in the intersection of power, race, and technology. She has traveled and worked in more than 30 countries in the field of information accessibility and data use for social change. Rahman is currently a fellow at the Data and Society Research Institute in New York City and a research lead at the Engine Room, where she leads their responsible data program. Um, so I think that, take it away. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And just one note, because I'm super social media, so if you guys are live tweeting or anything of that like, um, use hashtag art and feminism and at art and feminism on Twitter. Um, so before we start, I just wanted to, one, apologize to all of you for being late this morning. The struggle's so real, Saturdays are hard. Um, but before we get started with, Joanna has uh, brought a video for us, I just want everybody to just take one big deep breath. <sighs> Let it out, feel it, feel it. One more time, in, 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 <sighs> out, right? Um, I think Mackenzie got us off to a great start. This is not easy work. I mean, publishing online is something that is incremental, it's something that is exhausting, it's something that is amazingly beneficial, um, but it does take a toll on us, and that's something that we're definitely gonna broach today during our conversation. Um, this will definitely be a conversation full of levity, um, of course, but then of course some heavy stuff, so I just wanted to take the collective breath so we're all on the same page. Um, so Joanne, do you wanna start with your video? Hi, sure. Um, just to set your expectations, this isn't a very exciting video. We're going to watch just like <laughs> two seconds of the video, um, if we could pull it up. Um, mostly I wanted to use it to demonstrate um, something that happens. Oh, and you can see how many views as well. Like, and those are all that happened basically today. So it was, that's Progress. like, yeah. yeah, that the traffic just spiked. If you wanna like play a couple seconds and. <laughs> Joanne McNeil is an American writer, editor, Great, and art right? critic known for her personal <laughs> essays on technology. She is reportedly writing a book on internet culture. McNeil was the editor of Rhizome at the enough. New York. <laughs> but, so I, I think um, I, I wanted to play that video because it, it shows just what, what we're dealing with when we're talking about information online. There's just abundance. Like, and it's something that just about every media historian, every media theorist talks about. There, there was an age of like information of scarcity and now we have it in abundance. And that this, I don't, necessarily think a human before me ever saw that and I just saw it because I was googling something I was googling my name um, oh, so, so it, it was someone I think it's a bot that. I think it's a it, it had to be a uh, text-to-speech bot that was 
uh, program to but someone put turn it on, it on. on YouTube. Like, yeah, that they would pull up all the images and c I think it was all just like programs. And if you see um, the playlist for that user, it's just all these random Wikipedia pages. Wow. And the thing is, like a a piece like that to me, it's it's hilarious. It's just useless. Mm -hmm. Who's going to look at it? But there's still a possibility that one of those pages that day, everybody was looking for that person's name. Maybe someone loves listening to audio and is like cleaning the house. <laughs> they just like want to play the video so they don't have to read it. But it's possible that traffic could have spiked for one of these. And that's why a lot of like bot information exists. Like the, just the possibility that one of those entries might be valuable. And so like, what I wanted to focus on in our discussion is we talk a lot about writing, but I think just as valuable, but maybe unheralded is, is editing and the role of an editor. And that's what's pretty outstanding about Wikipedia is because it teaches people the value of editing and shaping and, <coughs> and clarifying and putting forth information and also what you choose to um, write about, that's kind of even the decision of whether you're going to write something or not, that's kind of an editorial decision. Um, just to, to give an example, like because I've worked as an editor and I know what it means to ch chase traffic and be, uh, be expected to hit quotas and it ultimately, it turns me into a bot like that video. It makes me feel like I just need to deliver something that I can reliably get in pr get enough views so I can sell ads against it. And uh, in our discussion, I can give specific examples, but I, I think that with a space like Wikipedia, with uh, it does have problems. It's hierarchical. It's bureaucratic. There there down there are drawbacks certainly, <coughs> but you can have all this information in one place and you can, uh, it, it's no longer driven based on page views. Yeah, totally. Um, so I wanted to um, start today's discussion also just to ask you guys, because whenever I talk about the internet, I'm always super curious about people's origin stories. Because we can get like super deep into the Wikipedia stuff um, and that's why we're here today. But I just wanted to know if you guys could talk a little bit before before you started to work for the internet, or before data was your work, what was your first encounter with the internet? I think one of mine was, um, I have two older brothers, um, and we got internet really early in my house, and uh, my first, one of my first most poignant memories is uh, one of my older brothers got ICQ, the ICQ messaging service, um, and I was really young at the time, and he had you know, an ICQ account and all these friends on ICQ that he would message with and he would talk to, and I had this massive tantrum that I wasn't allowed an ICQ account and he wouldn't let me on it. So my mom, not really understanding, was like, oh, let your little sister have an ICQ account. And of course, the only contact that I knew was him. Um, <laughs> but of course, if I was on the computer, he couldn't be on the computer. So she made us split our time on the computer so that he would chat to his friends and then I would go on ICQ and I would sit there looking at the one contact that was red because he was offline and I'd be like, well, at least I have an ICQ account now. <laughs> and I was very <laughs> proud of myself and he was like, what, like, why can't, you, you're not gonna talk to anyone. It's like, but I want an account too. I could talk to you. Look at me, I'm grown up too. Um, so that was one of my first, <laughs> that's one of my first accounts. It's funny because it speaks to almost your point too about like the lack of information and then the abundance because yeah. like I remember doing the phone share thing like I was I was an only child but I would share with my parents and my dad was always way more interested. Um, we got a computer in 1996 and it was a huge fight in my household because we like didn't have computer money um, but my dad was like it's the future and we're doing this and my mom was like mm-hmm and uh, so it was it was all about like just taking up space and just just having the access always felt like such a thing. And now if we're you just couldn't talk to anyone. If, in my case, right? I would I found people. I was like catfishing hardcore, <laughs> like by age ten. I loved it. I was like, I am like my aunt works for the Pentagon and like, and all these like weird little chat rooms. I was like always such a fake. Um, Joanne, do you have your first experience? You yeah, share? it was probably like ninety four, ninety five, and my parents set up AOL, and I think I'm still. I was really the only one who ended up using it, 
but I always, it was so visual with lots of clip art to demonstrate what chat rooms for message boards. So whenever there was like a cup of coffee or a film reel, I'd always click on those chat rooms, like the really, and there was one I went to, I think it was even called like the artist palette or something. And it would be like a chat room of probably like middle-aged artists in the Midwest, but I'd like <laughs> deliver all these like pretentious little statements about, well, I think art is all feelings and no thinking and just like <laughs> ridiculous things like that and like get into like debates with art, people that like identified as artists in this chat room. <laughs> totally. I, I thought, was thinking earlier too about the idea of editing over time because when, when I first joined the internet, similarly to you, Sarah, it was very private. And then, you know, Facebook arrived into my universe and I hopped on that shit, like, hardcore. I was like, oh my God, I can talk to these people that I kind of hate from high school when I'm at home. Uh, I, I went to boarding school. Um, and so I was wondering, like, if you guys could speak to, especially as professionals in the internet, what it means in a more abstract way to edit how you relate to the internet now and how you keep that as, like, a source of either progress in the work that you aim to accomplish in your career or as a, like, a positive space where you can be as an individual as well. So just the concept of editing and how you think about progress or um, positivity in your, in your world and your work. Yeah, I mean, I think, so I was thinking about this a lot recently. Um, I had to write an essay about um, how communications technologies affected generations of immigrants in my family. Um, and I was thinking about this a lot in the sense of, you know, like when my mum moved from Bangladesh to England, she would write letters to my grandma back in Bangladesh. And now they still have these like piles of, you know, blue airmail letters that they can look over and they have this archive. And now for me, like I left England like eight years ago and the way that I communicate most of my family in England and Bang in Bangladesh and other countries is mostly like WhatsApp and Facebook and emails. I mean, it used to be way more emails and now it's got less and less, like fewer and fewer emails. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess I was thinking about this not in the kind of professional sense, but in the archival sense of, you know, like my old MySpace page I deleted a few years ago, just because it was embarrassing and terrible. But also, I, I mean, I'm never going to get to see that again, and I didn't make any effort to kind of download it or download the images that came with it. Um, and yeah, I think it does come bring up this interesting thing of if they were offline, like letters and things, I would keep them for myself and I think, oh, how, how nostalgic and lovely. But because it's online and anyone can see them, like, oh my God, how embarrassing and terrible. Let's take this down so no one ever finds it. Um, and yeah, I guess, yeah, that archival piece I do find kind of interesting of what do we want to keep and think like, oh, that's lovely. But for me, I actually, I kind of use my, my blog, my personal blog like that. Um, there are... I went through a phase of, or like a couple of years of uh, making myself write a blog post every Sunday. So like weekly blog posts, and I would give myself an hour to write them, and I would post them, and I would kind of assume that nobody would really read them apart from maybe my mum. And every so often someone will say like, oh, I saw this post you wrote in 2013. I'm like, oh God, you did? Like, why did you see that? No one's meant to see that. Um, but I would never take them down. I guess I say this now, maybe in like five years time, I'll be even more embarrassed. Um, I would never take them down because there for me like this kind of, you can see the progression of my thinking and I can see how my thoughts have changed and I've always said that, you know, I consider kind of changing my opinion on something to be not, yeah, to be a kind of sign of progression and learning rather than, yeah, I said this in 2013 and I totally stick to it. Um, so in that way, it's like professional, professionally speaking, it's kind of a, a thing that I keep for that reason. Um, on that point, I, I've, something I've been doing just over the past few months just because of all these ho high profile hacks and um, not that I ever felt totally secure with my information online, but I've just <coughs> recently gone through and started deleting and deleting a lot of accounts I don't use. Like it, it just seems like maybe in 2011, every time there was a new service, I'd sign up for it and I'd, uh, you know, if there was like a new, because uh, anything could be the next Facebook or Twitter or something we can imagine. So if there was a new social network, I wanted to be the first on it. And consequently, all of my, my information is there, my name, my email address, my email address actually is valuable. I don't want random spam. I don't want to be on contact lists. I had this really weird experience where because I signed up for a one of those like 
question, anonymous question and answer accounts. Someone used my email to set up a dating site on all these weird sites. Like, really, they, they gave me a name like Tulip and a fake photo, and I was getting all these r random information, but it just made me so aware of, like, with this quest for traffic, social networks have a quest for um, users. So they're going to, I, I think it's possible this dating site actually was, they were the ones who were creating these fake accounts and attaching real emails to them. Um, so I've just been pruning and that experience, um, it felt really powerful because it felt like the, the opposite of what I normally do online, which is like collecting everything and making sure that I have everything saved. As, but in this, like, it was a weekend where I just tried to think of every single username for every random social network that I'd <coughs> signed up for in the past five years, and actually it was a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think about that too, that editing process. I like that you guys both took that question in that direction, because I just started blocking people for the first time. Oh, just, you kidding. I really, no. <laughs> no. I am just, Why? I try so, I mean, my, my work is sharing things. Yeah, you That's can what share, I, right. but you don't have to. Right, but that was the thing, is that no one, okay, well, we should have been friends yeah. years ago. <laughs> I'm here, Because I'm here, I was doing all this heavy lift on my own, and was just like, you know, if, if someone didn't agree with me and wanted to unfollow me, I was like, well, that's your loss. You know, I got really, like, whatever about it, and I <laughs> believe that very much. Um, but I never really understood the power of block, where you didn't have to, like, engage emotionally. And mute. And mute. Ugh, mute. I don't oh, even have mute. ad blockers on. Like I'm really like raw in the internet. Like I'm out there, um, and and changing over into a more kind of like partitioned internet space has been really wonderful and freeing. Like the other day, I literally blocked four people before I got out of bed. I was just like, you, 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 because like people came for the art and feminism, and I was just like, boop, 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 boop. Who's a delusional idiot now? Bye. Um, I love feminism, um, and and it, I think part of it for me too was thinking about being a black queer woman online and thinking about how I exist in the art world in which I occupy and wanting to shine as big of a light as possible, wanting to be a person of integrity and character, where it's like, you may not like the work that I'm doing, but you know, you could complain to someone and they'd be like, but you know she's great, right? Like, that was always my goal. Um, and I found myself a lot of times through this kind of internet discourse, being on panels with white dudes of the internet who are interested in being invisible which is the exact opposite of the work that I'm trying to do. I'm like, here I am and black as hell and here are these other great black people and here are these other great brown people and here are these women and you know, and these groups are not mutually exclusive. And um, so I wondered, especially to thinking about post-election um, and thinking about the optics of something like the Women's March, how you guys as data scientists and writers and critics and um, people who think about putting things out in the world, like what, if you have any thoughts about how that relates from either a data perspective or like a web-based perspective um, and, and what those optics, either from a personal perspective or if you have like some more macro level kind of consideration of what that meant to you. Um, well, this takes me to the, the question that comes up so often in panels like this is like echo chambers. And I have been thinking a lot about echo chambers like because People are talking about it like con like crazily uh, constantly, um, and one thing that has to be said is like you can diversify your media outlets, but some of them actually do the fact checking and the heavy lifting and the real reporting as opposed to propaganda. I don't think I, I think it's useful to look at something like Breitbart just to know what they're instructing their audiences. And I think it's really essential for uh, people in, mm -hmm. in more progressive. Do you want to tell everyone what Breitbart is in case That's they the Bannon propaganda news front. That's like, uh, basically it's the White House uh, propaganda website. And, but has like enormous traffic. Like it's very, it, over the past few years, it's definitely grown in influence. Um, I think it's important to, to keep an eye on Fox News to see what stories do make it to Fox News. Like, I think it's important for that. But if, if you have like a core sense of values in terms of what, what like general media literacy, like what is good reporting? It, do I know that this outlet ha will um, fact check all of its stories or like respond to um, like, 
letters to the editor or things like that? Is there like a, a institutional history that like is respectful of of you know information and 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 truth and accuracy? Um, but I, I, at the same time, like I, not to go on too long, but I, uh, something I did up into the election is I set up a private Twitter feed for like pundits that talk only about politics. Cause I didn't really want them in my main Twitter feed cause I knew that they just like, I, I wanted to be able to take a break from politics because it felt like, it, it felt so overwhelming that the opportunity to just like have this space that when I was worried about the election, I could just like click on this button and see all these people that that's all they're gonna talk about. And one thing I did is I made sure to put in people that I feel like I, I have some respect for or even if I don't necessarily agree with. And I've gotta say like, I don't really have any pro-Trump people in there. Like it's, cause I just don't really respect people who support Trump. I don't, and I, I I, I guess as an audience that it's okay to say that. You don't have to defend that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think but we're I all right. But I do have a lot of conservatives in there that I can. I feel like they're being, um, they're fair-minded and they do have some respect for, like they do have, they can argue their values. Um, so it was really eye-opening to see the process of their shift, whether they became more, um, more inclined to agree with the president or like what, that I, I guess because I just like, I wanted to understand how, like how people could think this way. And there are ways that you can like do a measured way of breaking your echo chamber in terms of like seeing what the other side says. And that doesn't necessarily mean their, their influence is going to like impact your beliefs. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you on kind of the, <coughs> the aspect of being intentional on what's in your own network. Um, and I've been thinking a lot over the, not just since the US election, but, but further back of what kinds of information I choose to take in and what gets my attention. Um, so I've made an effort on Twitter, for example, to follow people that have vastly different views to me from very different areas of the world who, you know, some of which I'm like, oh, I totally get you. And some of which I'm like, oh, I never would have thought that. Um, but again, there's that shared thing of like, I respect them all. Um, but as, you know, as someone, I only moved to the US in September, just in time for the fun. Um, <laughs> and I moved from, and I, I spent the UK in July, uh, July in the UK, so I was there for Brexit as well. Yay. Sorry, everyone, if it's, if it's me. Um, <laughs> but one thing I've done for a long time in, in a community that I'm involved in is called Global Voices. And I don't know if you know them. So they're a, yeah, so they're a, um, a network of, uh, editors, authors, uh, translators from all around the world. I think there's about 2,000 people involved now, and their, um, their mission is to cover issues that are underrepresented in the media, in mainstream media. So they focus on you know, countries that don't normally get into mainstream media in the US or in the UK or in kind of major Western countries. Um, and I follow them and I look at that website, that homepage almost every day, because there's all these massive things that are going on in parts of the world that I think, especially li living in the US, one of the things that has surprised me most, um, and obviously there are like special circumstances right now, is everyone's very, it's, it seems to be very kind of insular, like looking inwards and you can say like, oh, but that, you know, coup that happened yesterday and people will be like, what? Like, really? Like, okay, never mind. Um, and Global Voices for me is this place of, you know, they translate stuff from other languages, they have all these volunteers in countries all around the world, and I think about 80 different countries. Um, and that's, for me, a very refreshing way of getting information and news about countries and areas of the world that I wouldn't normally get into contact with through, you know, just hanging out in, in New York. Yeah, I, I think I, I just got back from a trip to Berlin and I was thinking about how absurdist New York internet is. It's just so small. Um, in the way that we consider and take in information. And whenever I hang out with a friend who's from somewhere else, I'm always just like, what's up? Like, <laughs> one of my friends is South Korean, and like, hearing about the inter like the email scandals in South Korea is so lit. Also, they've had a female, like a woman president for two years, and no one told me. Also, I didn't <laughs> seek it out. Um, but it, it makes me think about, you know, the concept of uh, unplugging, and, you know, thinking about living in apolitical, um, kind of life on the internet as if politics doesn't go on if we're not paying attention. Uh, and I try to think so much about how to be more investigative in the spaces that I find myself online um, and how 
because it is such a vast space, because it can be so dark and so scary, and then no one even talks about the dark web. No one even talks about that. Like, it's so insane to me that we kind of just rolled through the hacks of the, the voting. Like, it was just like, yeah, hackers, next question. It's like. Or even the things that happen on the dark. So I, um, colleagues of mine at Data and Society are looking into kind of alt Alt right, like white supremacist spaces online, so they spend all their days on Reddit and 4chan and 8chan and all these horribly dark spaces. So our lunchtime conversations are like terrible, <laughs> terrible and terrifying. Yeah, it's it's such a weird thing because my roommate is like a former IBM fellow, Salomia Sega. She's great. Google her, um, and she's my kind of like access into the deep parts of the internet because it could get. I mean, it's it's so bizarre. So like everybody in my family is on these social networks, so my, my aunt who is, I think she's 85 now, she writes on my Facebook wall every morning. And I have like that spectrum to like the deep like hacker friends and I was like, wow, the internet can be so many different things. And then how do I think about like these concepts of, of sharing and labor, especially within these spaces? Because we, at the very base and core, a lot of my work is storytelling and I see these mediums as just that, a medium for, ex for extending information, um, but some people, their medium is building the infrastructures for maintaining these bits of information. Um, and I'm rambling now, but I want to just get back to a question in that I'm thinking a lot about the concept of, of what a visual literacy looks like. And I'm wondering for you both, um, thinking about living in an era of facts and alternative facts, what considerations you've made in the way that you navigate the internet to better have, uh, to have better access to what could be considered the truth? Or do you even still believe in the truth online? I think, um, okay, so on the kind of alternative facts thing, I think it's very easy to forget that propaganda and governments lying has been a thing for ever. Forever. Forever. Yeah. Forever. That's like the only thing that he didn't like mess up on. I was like, yeah. you know what? Just like, like classic, New York Times has classic definitely authoritarian lied. authoritarian <laughs> government. Like, just that's what they do. Um, and I think, uh, I don't know, I've like in lots of the countries I've worked in before, um, governments lying is like, of course, you know, of course they do. And like, I, you know, I used to work in kind of open data stuff. And I remember one time I went back to Bangladesh, which is where my family's from. And I said, oh, you know, we work on helping governments release data and so that people can understand better what's going on. And they were like, oh, that's adorable that you'd believe them. It's like, oh, ow, ow, okay. I mean, yeah. Um, and like there's, there's so many places where that concept of like we encourage governments to open up and tell the truth so that we can make better informed decisions is just like laughable or literally like just like, oh, that's so naive and lovely that you would believe that that could ever be a thing. Um, so I think, yeah, I guess in, in that context, like I've always been kind of critical or like questioning or slightly disbelieving of what a government says unless there's kind of lots and lots of proof to back it up. Um, but I think also, I don't know, I was having a conversation with a colleague about this and I think for me it's not it's not truth that's broken, it's credibility. Mm. And we don't know what, what to believe. Like you could have someone telling the complete truth, but you might have this relationship of, you know, I, you should be the one that tells me the truth, but I just don't know anymore. And I have become a lot, like I'm questioning myself a lot more. And I mean, even institutions and things that I used to assume would tell me the truth, I guess, I don't know if you saw recently, there was a case of, um, the Guardian reported on uh, WhatsApp being having vulnerabilities and having a back door and all this stuff. And, um, and it was a story that they released based on the work of, I think, one PhD, like, one PhD student. Um, and afterwards, all these security experts said, like, that's not true. That's, you've reported on this badly, and it's putting lots of people in danger by you, you, by you questioning the kind of how, um, how safe WhatsApp is, and you're kind of encouraging them to use less safe things, so you're putting all these people in danger, and the Guardian just ignored it. Um, so the, this uh, a researcher called Zainab um, made this open letter and got 70 security experts and cryptographers and all these people to sign this, saying like these stories are irresponsible. You should not be publishing this story. And instead of retracting it, they've posted five more since then based on that story, and they haven't mentioned it, and they said, you know, and you mentioned earlier kind of readers' editors, um, and they said, oh, our readers' editor is on vacation at the moment, so there's nothing we can do right now. And it's been maybe two months, um, and they're just, they just keep pushing down on, like, doubling down on this story, and all these security experts <laughs> are saying this is irresponsible. Like, every day they're like, this is irresponsible. On your tech page, you now have six false stories right now. And I 
I mean, maybe it's naive, but I never would have thought The Guardian would do that, um, especially on something that's kind of like, is it true? Is it No, it's not like a political opinion. It's just like, this is false. Um, and it's on technology, and it's on something really important and something that I care deeply about. So that's really made me like, oh, no. <laughs> what what can we trust now? Um, I, I, I can't comment on necessarily what's going on with The Guardian, but I can say that the role, like going back to the idea of a role of an editor, that's a very invisible but necessary layer for the production of media. And I think most editors today have a role that's, I, I would see as looking similar to community manager in terms of you have to generate activity on, you need to generate clicks, you need to keep people on the site. Um, and some of that is just giving people what they want. And an example, if if anyone in this room wanted to make a story go viral, I can tell you exactly how to do it. You, um, yeah. sure, I, and I, I would say this is, a, th this is an unkind thing to do to the person in question, but like a classic, an example I can give, like I think very specific example, give it a headline, Michelle Obama, is she running for office? There's a question there. So you're kind of off the hook. First paragraph, say, well, the Obamas bought a house in Palm Springs. It looks like there might be a Senate election if Dianne Feinstein retires in 2018. And then last paragraph, just like fill it with a lot of random stuff, last paragraph. No one can confirm that she has any interest. And there are at least 10 <coughs> stories, even respectable publications like the Boston Globe have done this. And I feel like this is not very respectful of someone who, you know, you're writing about your dream for this person. And I think it captures like a lot, like a story like that is, is very uh, illustrative because it captures something that already happened. Hillary Clinton after Bill Clinton retired from, or le after his he served his presidency, that's when she ran for Senate. So we already have this kind of like notional understanding that this is potentially something that could happen. So it sounds correct. A lot of people would like it to happen because she has such an enormous approval rating. But what you've done here, you haven't done journalism, you've just like given your own wish for society some kind of hook and massaged it into something that can be published as a story. Now that's the kind of thing, if you publish that as a web editor, you can expect hundreds of thousands of clicks because that's just the kind of thing that people want to hear. Um, but you haven't done any, you haven't done any actual transfer of information. That's like, that's why I feel like Wikipedia is a very good example to contrast against um, against media outlets and old institutions um, because the editing process is transparent and even if, even if people have issues with it, you can see what's going on here and you can see the story being shaped. You can see, you can take part in it. Um, whereas like, and ultimately it isn't, traffic driven like that. You can be a minor figure. You can be an incredibly obscure uh, person from hundreds of years ago and still merit a page. You don't have to be this enormous personality. I think for me, just to hop on that for a question, um, I think for me one of, the, one of the things that I'm seeing more and more or the one of the things that I have most faith in right now is um, non-profit models. So one of the reasons, for me, the, the best thing about Wikipedia isn't just that it's transparent, because I think you can do lots of things, lots of terrible things out in the open. Um, you can, <laughs> not naming any names, um, but, too many today. yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm new to this country, I need to learn them all. Um, but that they're not trying to get clicks, and they're not going, f they're not a for-profit pro for model. So the kind of new, the media outlets that I have most faith in right now, and one of the reasons that I, I'm, a big believer in support of Global Voices, for example, is that it's non-profit. It's not trying to get clicks. It's not trying to get eyes on the news, on the site for no apparent reason. Then the kind of mission and of other non-profit outlets like ProPublica, for example, is informing the public. When and you say, but I do think, I just want to just step in and say, 
perhaps the um, incentives are different for nonprofit publishing as opposed to ad buying. Because I do think in nonprofits, if you're able to report on the number of clicks, you are more likely to get more grants. Yeah, but I think maybe then it's not number of clicks, it's may number of members, for example, which you could, yeah. So, I mean, I, I totally agree with you that there are metrics that go along with nonprofit models, yeah. um, but that they are different from ad buying. And I think I am seeing the value more of members who are willing to or able to pay because they believe in the mission rather than clicks on a story for potentially reasons like, oh my God, this tells me the future that I want to see too, which is different. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot about Wikipedia as an amazing space in that, I mean, okay, so crit criticisms of Wikipedia, right? It was like, like I was a kid who was in school when it, Wikipedia was a thing that people would use as their primary source. And it, it always was so funny to me because professors would just be like, you young people who have smaller brains and aren't actual humans, um, don't use Wikipedia as your primary source as if like you can't go to the sources and use the sources as your primary source. Like, I, always got, I always thought that that was so interesting. It's like, no, Wikipedia can be a really awesome tool if you just use it as a tool. It's not your first stop in the same way that like every book you check out of the library isn't your first stop. Um, and now I'm just ranting from my childhood and getting out my feelings. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up before we um, transition into more audience questions is just if you guys want to ruminate a little bit about specifically because, okay, so we're here for Wikipedia. We've covered Wikipedia. We're here for the internet. Did that. Nailed it. Um, one of the things I also want to talk about is a bit in how you consider feminism as part of your practice whether it be um, through editing on a personal level um, or professional level, but what in what ways feminism has impacted you if you feel particularly charged by it. Um, I always feel like that feminist tingle in every march um, and try to make a point of thinking about all of the women's, all the kinds of women's. I was, um, most, most of the reason why I was like a little late this morning was because um, the author of Americana, Chimamanda, was speaking wild shit about oh, what um, it means to be a woman and I was just, you know. I'm such a fan of her, or mm, no. I mean, I think, you, I think, we, I think the part of, of being a fan of someone is being ready to critique and then hopeful that they'll edit. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of my, greatest, my grandest hope for her is that she takes people's feedback into consideration and the damage of her words into consideration because it was yeah. like, whoa. Yeah. Um, which she, it's, it's, it doesn't bear repeating, but she basically was talking about privilege in relationship to being b born male and how the, there can't be a one-to-one -one experience between people who have transitioned and people who are born a certain gender. That was kind of like the rift of what she was saying, as if like anybody asked her opinion. Um, but anyway, I was wondering what, in what ways you think about feminism as something like, not everybody loves feminism as, as, a, as an ideology, as a corporate strategy. Um, oh. But I, I'm wondering what way that, that ro like rolls into your lives. Yeah, I mean, I think, so I'm quite lucky in that my kind of day job is working with um, individuals and organizations who are trying to make a positive social change on the world. Um, so that's kind of amazing and it's in and of itself. Um, so I actually get to work with lots of feminist activists um, and one of the most interesting things that I've seen is, or one of the most kind of the things that I'm struggling with at the moment is trying to help people who see themselves as feminists, for whom kind of the personal is political, everything is political, um, and they take this kind of feminist approach to everything, to help them transfer that to technical stuff. Because um, I think this, there is still this gap between um, how people consider their views and their politics in the real world and then online. And in my mind, they are kind of one and the same. You should take the same approach to, you know, if you think, if you are an ardent feminist, you should, you know, access is important. And, uh, you know, giving only limited amounts of information to certain people is not cool. And, you know, translation and localization is super important. And all these things that are kind of happen online and even things like partnering with, you know, I was speaking to a, um, or working with a feminist group last year and, they uh, decided to, they were a sm super small feminist collective. They, did, they had hardly any budget. Um, and they decided to take down their website and use a Facebook page instead. And that, I was like, whoa. And then I was quite taken aback. And then it turned out that they were getting fewer and fewer members. And they figured, oh, maybe, maybe our Facebook page isn't coming up as often. So they ended up giving part of their tiny budget, going, paying that towards Facebook ads. 
and the idea that this small, small feminist collective with hardly any money would be paying money to literally the biggest company in the entire world and not see anything weird about that with their feminist politics and then their online things was something that I really struggled with because part of me wanted to say, like, no, that's, that's wild, don't do that. But I was like, no, who am, I to, who am I to judge? You know, like, building websites does take time and it needs resources and it's hard and it is a lot easier to just use a Facebook page. Um, so that's something that I've really struggled with, like knowing when to say, and like lots of my work is about kind of talking people through and helping them make the best decisions for them and understanding that there's always gonna be these trade-offs that you just have to make based on your, your own decisions and these people, like everyone else knows their own context way better than I can. I can just kind of give them information. And that was one case that was really hard for me not to just be like, don't do it. I mean, no, it's your choice, it's your choice. Here's the information, don't do it. Stop. Um, well, uh, one thing that I find really encouraging about being a feminist in this year at this time, regardless of the political situation, feminism now is coming with the expectation that you have to call for solidarity, that there has to be an understanding of the ways in which other, other people's oppression fits into your own. And I think seeing that theme come through in the posters that have been at the marches, um, the people invited to speak, you know, having Janet Mock on the stage is, that's, I think even five years ago, if there was to be some kind of women's march, it wouldn't look like that. And I think people are finally understanding how essential it is to have that call for solidarity. And it's also coming through in the politicians themselves. I think, I, I really hope that in the, the next presidential election, the Democrat, I, I almost feel like will have to be someone who can speak clearly about what solidarity means. I see it slipping into some politicians' language in ways that's really encouraging, but I think that needs to be expressed in a sense that we're, we're all in this together. Um, there was a really great piece by Sarah Leonard in the, the Nation just this week about how the corporate kind of uh, use of feminism and how that can actually do harm. She was contrasting Sheryl Sandberg giving a, a lecture at Harvard with these um, these housekeepers who were who were striking for for um, and and the contrast between the two experiences and seeing how uh, this lean-in feminism actually did harm to the workers who were the workers who were, are less privileged than these executives are doing the work that makes it that benefits all of us. Meanwhile, these these feminists, it, that, or you know, corporate feminists, or white feminists, or whatever you want to call them, they were kind of cutting off that conversation, actively doing harm to their activism. Um, so I think that experiences like that and being able to- Can I just, in what way were they doing harm? Um, in terms of like, I, I wouldn't be able to necessarily repeat all the details because I know I'm going to screw things up. Was it up. happening at the same time? It was the happening same at the same time in oh, the okay, same location. So it's okay. kind of like... So it's just, just an attention Olympics kind of thing. Yeah, okay. and it's it's one of those things that like when you marginalize people who are already marginalized and then you're saying you're, you're doing feminism, that like that way that that compounds and you know, often like it, it's not enough to be the woman in the room. You have to have like some way like some entry points for many and um, that piece, I, 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 I feel like that's one of those pieces that everyone should read. It was so well written and I know I'm going to not do it justice by <laughs> summarizing. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting thing to, to try to tease through because, yeah, I don't know. That's why I asked the question earlier about the Women's March. Like I personally didn't go. I got on a plane to Cuba and didn't have internet for the first time in a really long time for that three solid days. It was like obscene. Just like <laughs> I can't answer emails, I can't text anyone. Um, I was never a person or a firm believer in unplugging. I didn't really understand the concept and why people kept telling me to do it. And then I got unplugged because I thought I would have like at least a little internet and then I didn't have any. Um, but it was so refreshing beyond like the pure fear that someone was going, I, I had like a very, I think rational fear that there was gonna be violence at the Women's March, but be that's just because I'm used to going to Black Lives Matter marches and um, they're a little bit less corporate, a um, <laughs> little bit less safe. Um, 
and so my my kind of personal view on feminism now is just like an understanding of just like a radical specificity um, and understanding that like who I'm referring to when I say we, who I'm referring to when I say they, who I'm referring to when I say us. Um, because I think a lot of times within these movements, it's quite easy for us in the interest of progress, really, like wanting to move forward to speak in those like big kind of words uh, without understanding that like there is going to be an inventorying um, you know, we shall overcome or we will survive this because we've survived other things. It's like, not everybody fucking survived. Yeah. And and we have to be realistic about those things. Um, and so that's kind of where my feminism lies and just like being really specific and rigid and difficult and messy. Um, and, you know, hopefully we, we will all work together to be better editors in this process. Um, so we're going to open up for audience Q&A. I, th I see people have like wiggled down to get more comfortable, but this is now a good time if you want to find a seat because we have some around and you don't have to like stand if your body doesn't stand well or if you would prefer to sit, this is a good time to do that. And if you guys have questions, um, I think we're going to go around with mics. Do we have a protocol for this? We have mics. Okay, great. Don't keep it Thank to questions, you. not comments, too. Absolutely. <laughs> um, early on, <laughs> you mentioned before. I'm a big fan of Wikipedia because I do see it as a democratic way of doing things. But you mentioned early on that you thought and found it hierarchical. And I'd really like some examples of how you find it hierarchical. Um, I, I, I'm not a heavy user myself. I feel like there have been issues with back and forth, how long it took before you could put people's correct pronouns. I mean, it wasn't until, uh, what was it, like 2010, 2011, that they finally let trans people use their their actual pronouns. I mean, there have been like issues with, and it's just peer production in general where like there are power dynamics that come into play. But like I said, I'm not like a, a deep user of it. Um, it's more like what I've observed and read about. I think it's certainly improved. I mean, if there's one example I thought was really inspiring, um, again, Chelsea Manning, they banned the House of Representatives two years ago because someone was vandalizing the pages of trans women like Laverne Cox and Chelsea Manning. So actually they banned the IP address of the, the House of Representatives because um, someone from that IP address. So it meant like an actual, they, they had like a, they couldn't post or like edit for 30 days or something like that. And it was great because it was just like, here's this like, you're applying this, um, this measure appropriately that even the House of Representatives having some like power or cachet, they're treated like every other organization in the space. So I, but like, like I said, power dynamics are anywhere. There's also something interesting too, as we like get to the next person's question, um, in kind of, and it, I, was, I wanted to talk about this, but we didn't get to it. Um, the privacy and, and public relationship to Wikipedia, because especially in New York, we're spoiled rotten that we can hold these kinds of spaces together, that we can get trainings. Um, and then you think about, or even like, I, I know like I was at Gallery Lafayette's Wikipedia Edit-a-thon two years ago, um, but thinking about how it can be a space for building and an understanding and unpacking in a private space, because then you think about issues of access and people who live with anxiety or depression, that you can have access to this like building of history and the space for um, both empowerment and a, a site for fear. Like I've had some weird Wikipedia experiences myself, um, but that it can happen uh, in such a robust way, like that's why I love Wikipedia, because you can like be at home with no socks on, or you can like put on makeup and come to MoMA and edit, and like those things are that that part of it's really cool and like makes the relationship to the hierarchy one that is fluid, which I think is like the best way to respond to any kind of hierarchy. Good question in the back. Hi, um, this is more of a technical question. So I've been hesitant to go to a lot of like the right sources because I don't want to give them traffic and I'm one person and they're already getting traffic, but- I mean right politically. Yes. Yeah. Oh yes, definitely. <laughs> um, <laughs> so do you know of any ways to access that information without giving them the traffic? There's a, there's a website, I think it's called Do Not Link. 
do not link dot com and then you so you can access the site but without letting them know that you're accessing without giving them the clicks that they would or the kind of ad revenue that they would otherwise so that could be a good way of um looking but not letting them have your money or their money hi kira gaunt um sheridan ford is my uh uh, Wikipedia name. I, I've been uh, teaching, I'm one of the professors that teaches Wikipedia in the classroom, and um, all of my classes were studying systemic bias, um, and it's kind of related to the question about hierarchy. Um, I, uh, it's a comment and then a question. Um, I think the, the hierarchy, the more you edit, the more you understand the hierarchy of Wikipedia, and that that's where the power of the platform is for me. Um, that when you get reverted, I told my students the other day, the first time you get reverted, you know you're a part of the community. <laughs> so that's how you get, that's your first entrance into the real space of the community. Um, but I still find there's so much um, effective and immaterial labor involved with, like I'm having difficulty. Oh, I love this, snaps. Yeah. Happy hands. Um, I'm editing St. Vincent, the musician's um, article. I was here last year talking about twerking, which I also edit and, um, and try to do, but that's another topic. <laughs> <laughs> it's for another time. Uh, that's where um, we're going right now. So um, I, I actually am experiencing as much resistance with female editors as with male editors. And so that's the hierarchy part, and I wish there was some more solidarity, like um, more acceptance of neutral point of views and not neutral point of view. Um, there are neutral points of views. There's neutral ways of thinking about blackness or black femaleness or transgenderness that's different than if you, you know, all knowledge has a knower and you can't e erase your biases. It's, you know, like it's just un. I don't care how much you think you're writing like an encyclopedia, you're revealing your whiteness or you're revealing your non-whiteness um, all the time. You can't erase that. And so I would love to see what you guys think about like what kinds are people doing kind of, um, I don't know, like revert activism or <laughs> something <laughs> like to help people who like it, it constantly feels like and my students tell me, I don't wanna do this. I don't want to keep doing this if everything I say and do is being policed. Yeah. And then you get written up as a vandal by a lot of the people who revert you, which for people of color and women is kind of like, I'm already doing the microaggressions offline, you know, and on Facebook. And now people don't even know exactly who they're doing it to, and it's, it's seen as okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think, so one of the experiences that I had with Wikipedia a couple of years ago was editing a page for a, women, a woman um, computer scientist, Hedy Lamar, and I got some changes reverted, and the reason that they gave was that it didn't have enough sources, but the reason that I was editing the Wikipedia page was because her work was ignored throughout history. Um, and that introduced this funny, uh, not, yeah, this funny thing of, you know, we can use Wikipedia to tell these stories, but if we need more sources, then it's going to be hard to get the sources because the point is that the patriarchy exists and women's work has been ignored for decades slash centuries. Um, and that really, and it was, it was funny because that experience, I wrote about it and then a journalist picked it up and wrote an article where she mentioned this experience that I'd had. And then I went back to Hedy Lamar's Wikipedia page afterwards and all these people had gone in and like taken up my, because I'd been like, no, I am not, like, I'm not doing this Wikipedia edit war. Like, nah, not my thing. And actually the page kind of ended up worse than it was when I started, which was really frustrating. But I'd said in the, in the interview with the journalist that like, I'm not gonna do this edit war because like, it's not my style um, and it's not fun. Um, but all the, the fact that all these other people had taken up this mantle and all these uh, people had said, like they'd all kind of gone in and said, but the point is that there's, no, there's not enough sources and this is why we're doing it and this is why the page is important, this is why the structure is important, this is why the first sentence really matters. Um, and they'd kind of taken up, so I guess it's not really revert activism in the sense, but they'd kind of seen that I was having this struggle and all these people stepped in without me asking or having to say anything like help. Um, and I really like that. 
Yeah, that's a, it's a brilliant question and consideration. I think a lot about, and not necessarily within the Wikipedia universe, because um, I'm not super deeply entrenched in it, but thinking about um, authorship and art history, because a lot of times there's this kind of revisionist art history that's told around marginalized people and how it's, in, it's a direct criticism of the art history that's been told before it. And I think that that prioritizes one and then makes the other new um, and in many ways can discredit the newness of um, these particular stories. And so, I mean, if there's anything that I would want to be relayed to students now or people who are coming into these spaces, digital or otherwise, is that there are stories that just need to be told, period. And that's it. And if you have it within you to tell them, do it. Understand that there will be pushback. But that doesn't mean that the story doesn't bear telling. I think that there, that's one of the kind of the myths of white supremacy and that, you know, there are certain stories that deserve acclaim and that's just not true. Like, villains are celebrated every day. Um, and so if we're going to exert labor, if we're going to put ourselves in direct risk of criticism or erasure, um, I think it's really important to know why you're fighting that fight and whom you're fighting that fight for. And we're gonna wrap <laughs> it up. But thank you guys so much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you so much to my brilliant co-panelists. Yeah, It's on? Okay, great. Um, I want to thank the panel. That was really awesome. I want to thank you all for coming. This is all on behalf of, of my, my co-lead co uh, co organizers. I want to thank all of the hundreds of events around the world on all six inhabited continents. I want to thank, we want to thank MoMA, and specifically we want to thank the Modern Women's Fund, which has provided major support for this. Um, and we want to thank the education department, all of the people here helping us run this. We want to thank all of our uh, Wik Wikipedia and Wikimedia um, allies. We want to thank the Wikimedia Foundation. We want to thank Wikimedia DC, Wikimedia New York City, Afro Crowd, and Black Lunch Table. We want to thank the volunteers that are here helping run this event. So all of that, okay, we can, we can, we can. I want to offer just a few reminders um, as we go through. As we said, we're going to start the training at 1145 in the Time Warner Theater on the second floor. If you don't have an account, show hands who doesn't have an account. Ooh, not that many. Awesome. OK, those of you that don't have an account, you can go out to the front desk and get an account with someone out there who will help you. How many of you have signed into the dashboard page? OK, all of you that have, you can help somebody else sign in. All the rest of you, you need to sign into the dashboard page. We're not using a Meetup page this year. We're using the dashboard page. If you want to know why, happy to come talk to one of the four of us. We can tell you all about all the wonky reasons. Um, the reality is, is it's going to be It's really important that you sign in. And as motivation for signing in and making your first edit, we have 100 of these I Think Feminist pins. Limited edition. Limited edition. <laughs> Very fabulous. Um, when you make your first edit and you sign into the page, come find one of the people with an armband, who are the people, the volunteers today, uh, and we will give you your, your pin. Um, hashtags. Art and feminism. Uh, art spelled A-N-D feminism. The plus sign will turn into two tags. Um, and now editing AF. So post that when you talk about the article you're actually editing. Um, work with each other. These are challenging things. It's helpful to have somebody else to bounce something off of and or team up. One person can work on one set of research for an area and one person can work on another area of a page or one person can do research, the other person can do the writing. Um, and lastly, start with edits to an existing article. If all you do today is add one footnote to one article, that's an accomplishment and that's valuable. Maybe maybe five footnotes, maybe ten footnotes. Or grammar. 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 Copy editing. Grammar's 
these are all valuable contributions. You don't have to start an article today in order for this to be a success. If you do want to start an article, come check, and you haven't done that before, come check in with somebody with an armband and we can help you through the process. Okay, awesome. What's that? Oh, did I not think, pa oh shoot, it was in handwriting. Also, PowerArts. PowerArts is running a table outside and they are very helpful. We've been partnering with them for three years now. Thank you.